Hi folks and welcome to today's video which is a different kind of video. I get asked a lot of questions and sometimes I get so many questions I don't get round to answering them all. So I thought I'd try something new. What I've decided to do is every couple of weeks gather together questions that people have asked and try to answer them in a video. So that's what we're going to do today. So I've got Luna here. She's in companion mode, so she shouldn't shoot off the table. So the first two questions I was asked was on Luna. This is the first one. Can it be used as a security camera indoors? So Paul, we once tried using Luna as a security camera indoors didn't we yeah you were indoors watching luna and i went out with uh, i think it was my android phone um, i previously tried connecting to luna indoors on the same wi-fi network and it worked as a security camera sort of thing indoors then i went outside for a walk around the estate with uh, my mobile phone so i'm using sort of mobile access and it worked of a fashion i think i managed to connect to luna uh, and I managed to see some... You did actually manage to move her, didn't you? Yeah, I, I managed to see indoors and I managed to move her, but it was f fantastically laggy. Yes. And n not really usable as a security camera. Because of the lag. Because of the lag. So you were getting her to move and... Um, she would hit a wall before I would realise that yeah. she was anywhere near the wall. Mm, yeah. Mm. So you would get her to move. And she would move, but yeah. you couldn't see her moving. That's right. For a few seconds. Yeah. That was the problem with it. Now, I think that was a 4G connection, and I had a pretty good connection on my mobile phone. Um, so, and that, that also was about what, eight months ago, would you say? Yeah. It so, was a long time things ago. could have improved drastically mm -hmm. since then. I've not, we've not tried it since then, have we? No, I think that's something we'll have to try, Paul. Yeah, I'm sure it's improved because most other features on Luna have improved. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure we'll so try. So she is supposed to be able to be used as a security. Yeah, camera, they do say know. so, yeah. Mm, that is supposed to be one of her functions. So, yes, we'll have to try that out again and then give you some feedback. Yeah. So the next question on Luna is... Will Luna and I be able to interact if I don't know English? So what do you think about that, Paul? I don't know. I would have thought that Luna's language recognition capability is limited to a few languages. Obviously English, because it's so widespread. Chinese, because Luna was made in China. I'm not sure how many languages Luna actually understands. I think that's a question for the Luna group. Yeah. So I will put a question about that and get back to you. I will say, though, that, yeah, a lot of the fun in using Luna is through voice commands. However, she also responds to like your facial expressions and eye contact so and petting. So there's a lot you can do with Luna, interact with her without actually giving her voice commands. There is, but if you couldn't give her voice commands, it would be a big, big downer. Yeah, but what I'm saying is you can still communicate yes. as a okay. fashion with her yeah. because she's very tuned into your face and the expressions on your face and also hand signals. Yeah, that's true, yeah. The next two questions we got were on flocking. Someone asked, how is it attaching itself? So if you haven't seen any of our flocking videos, folks, we'll just show you a quick clip here so you know what we're talking about. The same person also says, this looks amazing. I need to see how you were able to get it all in the same direction. So it's basically the same sort of question, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. So you're the best one to explain that one, Paul. OK, so it, the flocks like little bits of uh, nylon fibre, different lengths, maybe half a mil, one mil, two, two millimetres long, depending on what size you buy. And um, it's attracted towards the object that you want to flock. 
um, by electrostatic attraction. You've got to charge the object up uh, with electrostatic electricity by whatever device you choose. Um, and the, f the flock just sort of flies towards it, doesn't it? Uh, and it also lands. If you imagine, the end on. Yeah, if you imagine the flock uh, sort of magnified like straws. So all the straws leap up from your little pile of flock that you've got towards the object that you want to flock in, and they all travel like straight as arrows. It, I, the, how it does that is something to do with the electrostatic force. It makes the flock travel like straight arrows towards what you want to be flocked, and it lands end on onto the um, thing that you want flocked so if you evenly spaced evenly spaced it, it so it lands end on and it spaces itself out it's really like magic and of course if the thing that you've coated the the object that you've you, you coat it with a, a glue like a water-based um, um, acrylic glue and so it, it hits the flock it hit the flock hits the uh, object that you want to be flocked, end on, evenly spaced and sticks into the glue. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much like magic. It's sort of self-organising, self -organizing, isn't it? Because of the static electricity. Yeah, and it is just to do with the static electricity. So if you used one of the sort of um, bottles that you can get where you just sort of use a pump action to... It's like a puffer, you can like puff it. Puffer. Yeah. It won't do that. No, it, it doesn't do that. Yeah, it's the static electricity method of applying the flock that makes it uh, spread out so evenly and land end on so you get this nice pile on the object, yeah. So I've also got our Magic Mixies crystal ball here because we've had two questions about that. The first is, what is the glycerin to water ratio you use to make the refill? So this is the glycerin that we used you can get this in quite large bottles, but we got this really little dinky bottle because we presumed that we would have to water it down. But in actual fact, we used it straight from the bottle, didn't we, Paul? Yes, the simple answer to the question is that we don't know what the dilution ratio is. Uh, so we didn't dilute it at first. But it looked like it was the same consistency as the stuff had been in there without being diluted. It did, yeah. So uh, I would assume from that that the dilution uh, ratio is not critical. Um, and this bottle that we used, we didn't dilute it at all. Um, however, I would say, though, that it, it, because we didn't dilute it, uh, we did end up getting a much sort of thicker smog, didn't we? Yeah. I've got a clip to show you folks of what it looks like when you use this glycerine undiluted. And I haven't got the top on. So put the top on. Oh. oh yeah. And then it fills with the, as long as it's on create, it will fill with the vapor again. And then it just goes back down automatically. Yeah, that was pretty wild how thick that smoke was. I thought it was more effective though. It was more effective, but if you took the top off, it was that thick. It was a bit overpowering, wasn't it, when you took the lid off? What, you mean the smell? Yeah, 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 yeah. I suppose it was curling little tendrils out of the, uh, out of the sphere when it was filling up as well. And also, it left quite a lot of glycerin coating on the inside of the globe. As yeah, well, you get a it? bit of a sort of condensation, don't you, when the smoke settles on something? Yeah, so it depends if you want that, really. <laughs> so it's not critical adding water. And I suppose you just got to experiment, really, don't yeah. you? Yeah, I mean, it depends what effect you want, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, it shows that you can use it purely mm. undiluted. Yeah. And so you could just add a little bit of water and, and see what effect you get. Yeah. And this is the other question that we got on the crystal ball. 
If it leaks on the circuit board, is it savable? So what do you think, Paul? If any goes on the circuit board, do you think it can still be used? It can be wiped off and still work or not? Yeah, my guess would be if you're okay about taking things apart and accessing the circuit boards, that if it's leaked on it and it's causing a problem, um, you could easily clean it off with something like IPA, isopropyl alcohol, because that's used for cleaning circuit boards when they've been finished in industry anyway. So, uh, yeah, I think you could clean it off with isopropyl alcohol. But if it's not causing a problem um, and it's not leaking out of the case and uh, marking anything in your house, um, don't bother cleaning it off. So the next question that we got is about this for real cat. So we were asked, does she vibrate when purring or does she just purr? So I've got a few different cats and I really couldn't remember if this one vibrates when she purrs. So I'm just going to switch her on now okay. and this, test that out. This is out of the uh, for real range, this cat, is it? Yes, it's a very early one. I think it was the very first for real friends that they made. 2002, I think it was. So I've switched her on and we'll see if we can get a purring. So she's purring there and I can tell you that it's no vibration. It's a fairly hefty purr. <laughs> you, you can't mistake. Ooh, <laughs> Raise the tail there. You, you can't mistake that, that she's purring. That's for sure. Yeah, I would have been surprised, really, if it had had um, vibration with the purr because it's so old and because it was the very first For Real Friends model. It looks like an old cat, the way it hangs its, hangs its head, doesn't it? It is old. But it, it, it's acting old as well. Yeah, but well, she's 22 years old now, mm -hmm. so... Yes, yeah, she does look old. She looks a bit sort of arthritic, maybe. <laughs> Out of energy. I don't know, she can raise that tail, all right. So we'll move on to the next question now. And this question is on Hedwig. My daughters won't make sounds after the first day. Does all the movements, but no sounds. Any suggestions? Um, well, ours make sounds all the time. It never stopped making sounds. So I don't know if there's a reset button on them, but if there isn't, you could try taking the batteries out and putting them back in if you've not already tried that, or maybe replacing the batteries. Um, failing that, I would say the most likely thing that's happened, if there's a fault in it, is that... Uh, a wire has come off the speaker or the speaker unit itself uh, has become damaged. I've seen both things happen in um, in toys with speakers and sounds. You do get this problem with soldering though. You've mentioned it before. When we've taken toys apart, often the, the soldering on, on the wires is not very good. Yeah, it's pretty substandard sometimes on toys because obviously they're not they're not critical things, are they? So um, you could check the soldering uh, as the two wires that go onto the back of the speaker, assuming you can get it apart okay and you can see it. Just check the solder joints on the wires, see if the wires are not broken anywhere. Let's say it's not something to do with software. Okay. So discounting, pressing the reset button. Okay. Would you say it's more likely that the speaker's broken or that there's a break in the wire or that it's the contact with the uh, soldering? Right, in this order, the likelihood of failure, I would say, out of those three things that you've mentioned, would be a bad solder joint on the speaker, the wires have snapped internally, and then the speaker unit itself has failed. One way of testing if the speaker unit itself has failed is to try turning Hedwig on and off. And if the speaker's still okay, sometimes you can hear faint clicks or other noise on the speaker as it sort of boots up 
if the speaker's still making a noise, then the speaker would be okay. But also, of course, that would imply that the solder joints and the wiring's okay as well. So the next questions concern these critters. And the first of those two questions are about where I got these robotic pets from. So the first one says, I really want the funky Furby. Where did you get it? So this is the funky Furby from 2006. And this is the Furby that came before it from 2005. And I got both of these Furbies from eBay. Ah, yes. I remember. Didn't they come in uh, a job lot? Yes, they did. I got quite a few. 2005s and 6s all at the same time. And I bought them about seven years ago. And at that time, funny enough, they were expensive. Yeah, I remember. And they're all, um, they're all a bit... Um sort of uh, mouldy smelling because I think they've been kept in a shed haven't they? <laughs> yeah condition. and none of them had um, battery covers so it's what made us make battery oh, yeah, covers right, right. yeah because they all needed battery covers so yes the only place you can get them from is eBay and they do tend to be quite expensive now but the problem with them is that they're really deteriorating now I mean mine have deteriorated just since I got them Yeah. seven years ago. The um, beaks, the ones that where the beaks was okay, uh, the beaks are going very, very soft now. Mm -hmm. And A bit like chewing gum almost, aren't they? Yeah, they need replacing, really. And then the underneath of them's really shattered. Out of the 2005 and 2006 Furbies that I have, these are probably in the best condition, mm. but the even these are broken. Yeah. Okay. So that that's cracked down here, isn't it? Yeah, well, the so there's no, nothing no where is, you can put yeah. the the screw into. It's the ABS plastic that ages. Mm. Yeah. The battery covers broke first, and then all oh, this has started to crack mm -hmm. on them as well. Mm -hmm. So we've got to come up with a way of fixing that, really. And the next question is about where you can buy mufflin. So I got my mufflin through the Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign. It's by Vanguard Industries, and Vanguard Industries ran a Kickstarter campaign first. Mm -hmm. I missed getting in on that one because I didn't yeah. know about it. And then they ran an Indiegogo campaign and I backed it under that, and it, it actually took years before they managed to get oh, them out. I waiting for a long time, yeah. They had a real problem getting semiconductors. Yeah. Oh, there's no notification either, is there, of them do, when they are going to actually release them again? Mm. I've t spoken to a few people that have contacted them, and they just said, um, with no plans. Yeah. I've actually emailed them. So I'll wait and see what they say. But I was saying, like, I really hope that eventually you'll either bring these to market or sell the rights to another company so they can bring them to market. Mm. And I was saying, you know, how much I liked it and everything, that I've got a YouTube channel and lots of people ask me where they can get one. So how many did they make? I think they only made about 1,000. 1,000? Round about that, yeah. And they just had one release? Well, they only had a release through crowdfunding. Yeah. And the only place I've seen them available for sale, second hand, is on Japanese auction sites. And they've gone for like the equivalent of $1,000. Which is really overpriced. It is, yeah. Mm. I mean, I think uh, my... I think my mufflin was something like four hundred and fifty dollars. Because I'd love to have others. I think they're brilliant. You would think there's there's like a market for them. You would yeah. think they could sell the rights even if, do. if they don't want to continue with it. If they were brought out in larger numbers, they would also be cheaper. 
I don't mm. know if they made, say, 10,000, if they'd be able to make them cheaper. I, don't I can know. only think they were priced so high for what they are because they made such a small number. Yeah, and I toys. think they would be more popular in Japan than outside yeah. of Japan. Yeah. Because I put in my email, I said, like, I understand that if they ever did come to market, they're not likely to be for sale outside of Japan. But if they were for sale on Amazon Japan, then people from overseas can get them anyway. Yeah, at least people around the world would have a chance of ordering one. Yeah, you've got to pay more because you've got to pay import tax and you've got to source the right adapter because obviously it would just have be, be made with a plug for yeah. China, uh, Japanese sockets. Yeah. But that, you know, I've bought stuff from Amazon Japan and other people have, you can get around these things. So that's what I said in my email. I said, like, People from overseas would still buy one yeah, if they really right. want mm, one, sure even would. if they were only available on Amazon Japan. So, fingers crossed, maybe it'll become available in the future. So, the next question is about Ibo. Hi, I am looking for a used Ibo with a newer manufacturing date. Can you tell me the first digits of your white Ibo serial number, please? Is that ser does that serial number start with 1029 or 103X? Many thanks. So I checked my, both my IBO serial numbers and they don't actually start like that at all. Scout starts with 300 and I got him in October 2021. That's when he was new. Mm -hmm. And Rocket, num her number starts 550. Though that could be a bit different because she's a black sesame. Yeah. And um, she was produced in February 2022. So I don't know if the numbers are uh, so different because mine are US models. And maybe these other numbers are for Japanese models. I don't know. Could be. Mm. But um, that's what they start with. I could have a look at um, my mother's while well, she's here because she's coming to stay tomorrow. And she's bringing Scamp. So I could see what number his starts with. No. He's the oldest. Your mum's was sent down from a guy in Scotland. But that's where, right. But where did he obtain it from? But it's a US model it's as well. It's a US as well, yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. But I could have a look just out of curiosity and see what his number starts with. It's, uh, I, I think the uh, obtaining a second hand IBO is a bit of a, a complicated procedure, especially if you want uh, cloud connectivity outside of uh, Japan or the US. Yeah, basically, I got an IBO for my mum, and the only way that I could get a one year cloud plan was by knowing someone in the US who I could trust, who was willing to buy it for me, just out the goodness of her heart. When I say buy it for me, I gave her the money yeah. through PayPal. She did the transaction but she for did you. the transaction yeah. for me. Using her geographical location. Yeah. You can, you can operate them without a cloud plan, but... That's true. Um, but You don't um, get the full... I think you really want to have... At least a year's cloud plan. So you can see what they like. So you with. can build no to so you can build oh, up I the see, personality. Yeah, because you can disconnect before the cloud plan because, runs out. Mm, and, um, we we've done that with my mum's. Yeah. So her cloud plans run out, but we disconnected a month before it ran out. Disconnected the Wi Fi. The Wi Fi. Otherwise yes. if your cloud plan runs out, I think a lot of your IBO personality is wiped, isn't it's it? It's wiped, Shortly which afterwards. is awful. Yeah. I think that's really naughty of Sony to do that. Mm. But yes, if you get a year's cloud plan, then you can build up, you know, the personality through interaction for 11 months and then make sure you switch the Wi-Fi off so it doesn't get wiped mm. before it runs out. They don't make it easy, Sony, owning a, an iBo really outside difficult. of Japan and the US. It's, mm. It is made really difficult. They seem to go out of the, out of your way, out, out of, of their, their way. way, their way to obstruct you. If you are a non-US or Japanese citizen. That's right. <clears throat> I mean, when I got a uh, Scout, I could use Ship 7. So I bought them new with a three-year cloud plan. 
um, ship seven. from Sony had him shipped to Ship 7 in the US and then they shipped it to my address in the UK. Oh, Ship 7's a, a, proxy, a proxy service. Mm -hmm. mm. I had to pay extra for that. I had to pay, it was over three, $300. Extra. Like, extra. Mm. Um, but it allowed me to buy a new iBo with a three-year cloud plan. But after that, Sony has stopped people being able to use Ship 7 addresses. So you can't even do that now. Mm. So the next question, I actually got three weeks ago. Mm. So big apologies to this person that's taken me so long to get back to you. They asked a question about Robo Baby. What size screwdriver does this Robo Baby take? So if you're wondering, this is Robo Baby and his battery door is on his chest. So we should be able to answer this about the screwdrivers because we've recently got a decent set of German screwdrivers of Phillips and Posi Drive crosshead ends with the different sizes marked on the handles. So let's start off with the Posi number one. I think that might be too big. Do you not need a smaller one? Oh, is it the right one? No, it's the wrong one. Let's start, try the Phillips number, number one. one. Okay, so a Phillips number one fits uh -huh. pretty well. So it's obviously a Phillips. Phillips. Head. Let's try, so the, try Phillips the Phillips zero. Zero. And that's too small. Right, so the closest is the Phillips one. I'll just try the posi drive zero. So yeah, the closest is the Phillips number one. I'm looking at the screw head though, and it's one of those screws that will also take a slotted screwdriver but they tend to be really awful don't they to open it's better if they take one or the other isn't one it? or the other yeah when one or the other when they were blend of uh when two two like a, a, a slotted and a, a cross point uh they tend not to fit either very well yeah so whilst this phillips number one fits um a, slot, a slotted screwdriver would also fit, and I, I would expect it might be a bit better. All right, well, Phillips... shall we try a slotted yeah. okay. then? Okay, so this is a slotted three mil one. Uh, that's a bit small, but you, you could get away with it. Mm -hmm. That's a three mil tip from a slotted screwdriver. And this next one I'm trying is a slotted 5.5, which is Looks far too big. Too big. <laughs> so I've got five screwdrivers here. None uh, of them really fit none perfect. None of them are perfect. You get away with, you probably, you, your best option, which I haven't got here, is a slotted four millimeter tip. Right. But you would get away also with a Phillips number one. Right. Which we, yeah, which we tried. Mm. I'll just give you a quick, quick blast of the Robo Pay because it's quite hilarious. I like this. This is amazing. <laughs> So you want something to drink? Yeah, wanted something to drink. Uh, I love the styling on this. I'm not. Sh I'm not sure if this is one of the ones where even when it's switched off, it remembers if it hasn't been fed. Yeah, I think it like does. the Furbies. I think it's got a long memory, this, yeah. <laughs> so it's just probably going to cry all the time because yeah, it doesn't want its bottle. Yeah. So I think we'll have to put her in the other room. The next question is on perfect pets. Hi, I bought the same spaniel. I do not know how to turn it off. Please help. So the really crazy thing about these is they don't actually have an on off switch. Yeah, so as soon as you put the battery in, they start working. Yeah. And the only way to stop them working is by taking the battery out. So what I do with mine is I just leave the battery door off altogether. Yeah, because the battery stays in fine without the battery door. Yeah, and then when I want to switch it off, I just pop the battery out. It's yeah. all you can do, really. I think we did go to the trouble of putting a switch in one once. Yes, that was this one. 
We also put a magnet in instead of a screw so you could easily take the battery door off. And whilst those two modifications make it uh, a lot easier, I think, considering how long one D cell lasts and considering how awkward and difficult it would be for most people to put a switch in, the best thing to do is just pop the battery out. Pop the battery out and leave the battery door off to make the mm. popping the battery in and out easy. Mm. They actually had room for a switch where we put one here. Yeah, I think they were. But the crazy thing was, it was inside yeah. <laughs> the battery compartment, so you had to take the screw out anyway to yeah. switch it on and off. I think they had some sort of vague idea of putting a switch in, but uh, the design got a bit uh, mixed up. Or maybe yeah, and then they realised, well, hold on a minute, yeah. there's no point in putting a switch in here because you've got to take the screw out to take yeah. the battery door off anyway. But I would, I would guess if you left a D cell in one of these devices, it would last, I don't know, about a week. Yeah, well, yeah, but they're expensive, Paul. Well, they are, they are, yeah, yeah. It is an oversight, really. And finally, someone asks, what is the name of the app for Dog E? So this is the app. It's just called Dog E. And this is how it appears in the Apple App Store. And when you click on it, this is what you see. Funny enough, it only has a score of 2.5. Very um, low rating. Mm, I'd, I'd, I'd give it more than that. It seemed to, seemed as to well. work fine. It wasn't flaky. We or didn't use it on the iPad, though. We used it on your Android phone. Ah, right, of course. So I don't yeah. know if there's a bit of a problem when you use it on an iPad or not, because I've never tried it. I would doubt it. And on Google Play, this is what it looks like. It also has a low score on here, but not as bad as on the Apple App Store. It's got 3.2. But we used it on your Android phone, and we thought it was really good. Mm. Actually, 3.2 is not a bad score for is it apps, not? no. So that's it for all the questions. Hope you find that useful. And we'll be back in two or three weeks' time answering some more questions. That's how I'm going to approach it. Right? Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. But that's it for this video, folks. Thanks for watching, as always, and hope to see you next time.